Well, this month, we are focusing on New Year's resolutions. And on already New Year's Eve and New Year's Day seems so far away from me so long ago. And I wonder that if you're like me and the New Year's resolutions that you've already made have faded into the past. And I really hope not, because this month we have begun talking about New Year's resolutions from God's point of view. <coughs> and we've been turning into the book of Colossians as we look there for some of Paul's guidance into doing things, making resolutions, making decisions that are going to lead us close to God's own heart, decisions that are going to lead us right up to the threshold and through the doorway of the kingdom of heaven. So last week, we looked at the first resolution, which was to live a life worthy of the Lord and to try and please Him in every way. And I trust that this is something that you've been thinking upon, cogitating all week on, and already have taken some action in, as you thought, what is it going to take to please God? And am I willing to do that? Have I resolved to live a life worthy of God? With that in the back of our minds, then, we're going to turn to this week's resolution which will be in the first chapter of Colossians, if you've been reading along with that, which is to continue in our faith, established and firm, and not move from a hope held out in the gospel. Especially this last bit, a hope held out in the gospel. Now remember that the whole Christmas Advent series was centered on God ripping open the heavens and coming down into our world to offer us salvation, to offer us light in the darkness and confusion of the world around us, to offer us a beacon of hope. And that hope, of course, is the gospel, the gospel that God loves us so much that he sent his son down from heaven into our world. And so we're going to be looking at the hope of the gospel. And I love this particular passage because it is, in a way, a continuation of the Christmas story itself. In Christmas, of course, we, we focus all of our attention on this little baby Jesus, born in the manger, came down from heaven, who grew up among us. And sometimes I wonder if our focus becomes so small that we focus on the little baby Jesus and even later on the person of Jesus that we forget to really try to encounter and establish in our minds the fullness of who Jesus is. Jesus Christ did not begin the moment he was born in this world, but he was with God in the very beginning. As, as Jan read earlier from the Gospel of Matthew, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the very beginning. And that's before the beginning of creation. That's all the time that God has ever been in existence. Jesus is. And it's so important for us to understand that. And so today we're going to try and encounter a little bit more than even a mere cosmological glimpse of Jesus Christ and God. Because we're going to find in this passage a little bit broader picture. I'm going to read through it first, and then we're going to take a few of these pieces apart. It says, He is the image of of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers, or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. 
For God was pleased to have all his fullness well in him, and through him to reconcile all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God, you were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith established and firm, not move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you've heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, I become a servant. May God add his blessings to these words and let them dwell in your hearts. So I want to start off with this whole idea that Jesus is the image of the invisible God, or we could say it differently, that Jesus is the visible of the invisible. We have felt God. We've experienced God. We have walked with God. We have felt God's anger. We have felt when God has been pleased with us. But I'm betting that nobody here has actually, with their own eyes, physically seen God. And indeed, I believe that that is an impossibility because well, we count on a God that not only is here with us now in this room, but as well as greater and far beyond all of creation. One of the words that they taught us in seminary is circumambient. I'm going to test you on that later, so I'll write it down. But, and it presents this picture exactly like what I just said of a God that is so much greater even than all creation. One of the, one of the word pictures they gave us was almost as if creation itself is in the womb of God, where all where God is part of all of creation, but so much beyond that, so that we who are within the womb of God, as it were, are completely incapable of seeing the magnificent magnificence and the greatness of God, which is so much beyond us. And indeed, it offers us a little bit of a glimpse that one day, one day in God's own kingdom, we will be able to see as if being born outside of the womb, the greatness and the magnificence of God. So we have this picture of God which is beyond our comprehension, beyond our ability to, to see all that God encompasses. And so he has given us this <coughs> Jesus Christ, that he is the image of the visible of the unseeable, that through him we might glimpse a portal into the world of God. That when we take a look at Jesus Christ, we see him for who he truly is. You know, we see through Jesus. And I want to read a little bit from John 14. Jesus is debating with the disciples. <clears throat> Because they want to see God, just like we want to see God. And they're struggling with this idea. He says, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you for such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? And then in Hebrews, I love this passage. It's so magnificent. It says the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. And after he provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. The word pictures help us to understand, I think, that in Jesus, the unknowable, can be known. The unseeable can be seen. That when we have encountered him, even in his appearance as a human being, 
we encounter the very fullness of God holding nothing back. The Colossians passage continues, it says, For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. You know, and I love this part in the, in the Gospel of John that I just read a few minutes ago because it's so powerful. You know, we go back into Genesis and it says, God spoke and these things came into being. But we see from these passages that God spoke and it was through Jesus Christ that these things came into being. And it's kind of hard sometimes to, se to separate the persons of the Trinity God the Father, Jesus the Son, the Holy Spirit, because in each of them the fullness of God is fully represented and fully in place. But each has different roles, and this is one of Jesus' roles. <coughs> he was the one when God spoke. He went out and did the work. He formed up all of creation and formed us as well. It continues on to say he's before all things, and in him all things hold together. Before all things. That means Jesus is preeminent. He was literally before all of creation, and he is the king of all of creation. He is the ruler of all of creation. So that when he speaks, he speaks. For all the persons of God. He speaks with all of the full authority. And we being his creation, it is natural that we should look to him for guidance. For orders, if you will. For direction. Because when we cooperate with what Jesus has created, we're cooperating for the very benefit of ourselves. For all of creation as well. When we act through Jesus, we're acting for our best interests. And it says here even more, he is the beginning, and he was. When God, when God told Moses in the beginning, when he began to create, Jesus was the one that did the actual work. He was there in the beginning. But it also says he was the firstborn among the dead. And this is the part that is so critical to each one of us. His life as a human being came to an end that day on the cross. It was verified by all sorts of people. He came back from the dead. God the Father and the Spirit held his spirit in their hands, safe and secure, so that three days later they would give it back to him. And he would come back to life resurrected. And through that resurrection to be able to prove to us, to show to us that his claims that he was the Lord even over death itself was absolutely true. He was the firstborn of all that had died and behold, he came back to life again. And that proof was what gives us that special hope that not only can we live better lives here and now. But later on, when our physical bodies perish, we who belong to Christ have that hope of eternal life and God's incredible great kingdom. The great kingdom that will never crumble because it was made by Jesus Christ himself. So this is that hope, that gospel. And this is the thing that really comes to me because it says in him all the fullness of God dwells. So when I get down on my knees at night and pray, or in the morning, and I pray to Jesus, I can pray to Jesus with the complete confidence that whatever I say to him, he has complete authority and power to act on those words, to work on my behalf that nothing that he says is going to be will be contradicted 
by the Holy Spirit of God the Father that he speaks <laughs> with all the power and authority of God and the Spirit as well. And this is important to me. You know, so many times, if I've got a problem somewhere in a, in a store or with, a, with an establishment, I really don't like to go to the person, to the retail clerk, or, or to the, the assistant manager, or sometimes even just the, the department manager. I want to go straight to the top. I want to talk to the one who can absolutely get things done. You know, I, I used to love it back a lot, a long, long time ago when I was in construction. I like to buy craftsman tools. Craftsman makes great tools. And the thing about them is, is when I bought them back then, it was satisfaction, lifetime guarantee that if there was ever something about that tool that I didn't like, I got to take it back and get a new one. Well, when I was learning how to do electrical work, I can't tell you how many times I'd blow the end off of a pair of pliers. And I'd take that pair of pliers back to Sears, I'd go up to the person at the cash register and I'd say, I'd like to exchange these for a new pair of pliers. Now, most of the time they're pretty cooperative, but every so often I'm wondering, well, it looks to me like you abused that, and I don't know if we're going to, let me talk to your manager. The manager would come over and I'd start in on my story, and if that one started to complain a little bit, I'd raise my voice a little bit louder. And I talked with the next one up. And sure enough, sooner or later, the more layers you went up through the management towards the top, you were going to get satisfaction, if nothing else, other than to get you the heck out of the store. But you know, that's one of the reasons. That, okay, I understand. You may not have enough authority. I'm going to go the next step higher. But in Jesus Christ, we have got, he has all the authority he speaks on behalf of the other two persons of the Trinity in complete authority. So through him, I can approach God and know that whatever Jesus says is written even better than in stone. Because Moses broke the stone tablets. And eventually, probably the other set turned into sand. But God's word, through Jesus Christ, stands forever. So God, or Jesus, did redeem us on the cross. Yes, God the Father, in cooperation with the Trinity, with the Spirit, did send Him into our world to walk with us, to teach us, to figure out what it really meant to be truly human. And part of Jesus' mission from the very beginning was to die on our behalf. But you know that one story about Jesus kneeling at the rock in Gethsemane, that one right up there, and praying to God, Lord, take this cup from me. He knew exactly what was going to happen. There was no doubt what was going to happen. And the human part of Jesus was going to suffer greatly. He was going to be beaten within an inch of his life. He was going to be spat upon and mocked. And then they were going to nail him literally nail him to the cross and hang him there. You know, the human part of him struggled with that so much and he prayed that God would take that away from him. That was always by God's will. And ultimately, that was the last temptation. Remember in the temptations early in the gospel? He had the three temptations and Satan left him until a more opportune time. This was the opportune time. And Satan had to be need nibbling around the edges trying to tell me, you don't have to do this. You've got all the power. You can get down off the cross. You've got the power to not to even be arrested. That was Jesus' choice. He chose to go to the cross on our behalf. The same love that God has for each one of us was fully imbued in Him. 
And it was that love that he has for each one of us that says, you know what? I am willing to die for your sin. I've got the authority because of what I am doing that when I make that decision to be nailed up on that cross, I have the authority to forgive your sins. And so he did. Which brings us back to the resolution for today. For he wrote, if you continue in your faith, the faith you had when you first understood God, when you first felt God touch your heart, when Jesus forgave your sin, when you accepted him as your Savior, when you continue in that faith, because it's something we have to live out every day of our lives, when we continue in that faith, established and firm, not moved from a hope held out in the gospel. We have every right to expect we'll be welcomed into the kingdom of God. So therefore, for today's resolution, let us continue in our faith. Let us maintain it established and firm in our hearts and not be moved from the hope. Not allow anybody to talk us out of it. Not listen to any voice which tries to tell you it's not real. Not be moved from it. And believe in the gospel that God loves you so much that he did everything for you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, you are so much more than we can possibly imagine. Yet when we glimpse you, we glimpse the Father and the Spirit and all their fullness together. Lead us by the hand, waiting for the day that we will exit from the womb and emerge into the fullness of your kingdom. Behold God in all of his glory. Bless us this day in Jesus' name. Now he's urged us to help out as well for those in this world and this creation. Part of that is through our gifts and our offerings. I'd, I'd invite